Ecuador is a water-rich nation with three times the international average amount of fresh water per person. But incredibly, Quito, the capital city, is still at risk of experiencing severe water shortages by 2025. That's because, say water experts Nature Inc. has talked to, the authorities are neglecting one of its best assets, the Paramo. It's the name for the watershed on the slopes of the Andes, one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. This is where the water of the Amazon is being born. Let us come inside of the highest rainforest we can find on Earth. Because of the high air humidity, mosses go very well. Those mosses as such catch in the mist and also retain it and it passes through the cloak of mosses to the soil. Pull a little bit out and water peaks out of, that, of those mosses. In effect, the Paramo is a giant 14,000 square kilometer natural sponge, four times bigger than the Catskills. It absorbs, then releases abundant clean water for free. It's the main source of water for the two million people in Quito. But Ecuador has a history of economic and political turbulence. And one of the fallouts has been a neglect of the watershed with potentially disastrous consequences, according to the country's leading water NGO. Everything we have done in the past few decades has not worked. The system of government over the watershed has been deficient. It's been weak and complicated. 27,000 people live on the Paramo in Ecuador, and their farming is damaging the watershed. And Quito's population is expanding fast, leaving it at risk of running short of water in 20 years. So the government is planning to build a giant dam instead of relying on the Paramo. Quito has been doubling its population every 25 years. That means that in the next 25 years, we have to carry out many projects, just like in the past. The dam would divert 28 rivers that help feed the Amazon and use them to supply Quito with water. It will cost around $1.2 billion, which for a city and an economy like ours is a very large investment. The dam is facing legal challenges from communities in the Amazon who fear it will reduce the flow to the Great River. But is such an expensive dam really necessary? The government itself estimates that up to 65% of Quito's water is wasted through leaks and mismanagement. According to the UN, that makes Quito the city with one of the highest per capita water uses in Latin America. To the conservation lobbyists, the answer is obvious. Use some of the money that would be spent on the Rios Orientales dam on stopping the wastage and protecting the Paramo. Instead of the Rios Orientales with their um, environmental impact, we can also invest to make sure that the demand per capita decreases. Some experts believe that if Quito reduced its water wastage, Ecuador could follow Catskill's model. It could compensate the 27,000 people living on the Paramo and guarantee a clean and cheaper water supply for Quito. Professor Felipe Cisneros is a water resources expert advising the Latin American equivalent of the World Bank. Provided that we manage the preservation of the Paramo and reduce water wastage, it will be much cheaper to get nature itself to provide the flows we require rather than building large construction projects. The International Union for Conservation of Nature is helping the government negotiate with the Paramo communities to pay the money in return for preserving it. And one business in Quito is already doing its bit for watershed conservation. This brewery has halved its water consumption and puts the money it's saved on water bills towards preserving the Paramo. By going from 8 to 4 cubic meters of water, we have reduced our water bill by 50%. And the fact that you make an effort to optimize the use of your resources is not just socially responsible, it's also excellent business. Economists at the Gund Institute in Vermont in the USA estimate that the global value of ecosystems like the Paramo for providing water regulation and supply is $2.3 trillion.
According to the UN, 30% of the world's population is suffering from water scarcity. And Jordan is the fifth most water-poor country in the world. Water in the capital city, Amman, is rationed during the dry season. From May to October, homes only get supplies once a week, and sometimes just once a fortnight. The Jordan River could even run dry, no water flowing between its famous banks. The amount of available resources for drinking purposes was just enough for the demand. So any failure in the system or failure in supply will be felt immediately as a crisis. But historically, despite being 75% desert, Jordan's always had just about enough water to support its population. So what's gone wrong? Partly it's because of a huge influx of immigrants. Incredibly, 40% of its 6 million population are refugees from Palestine and more recently Iraq. You know, our leaders, uh, God bless them, the Hashemites, they're uh, welcoming all the Arabs. Within a couple of months, we had 800,000 immigrants came to Amman and the neighboring suburb of Amman. This affected our infrastructure tremendously. The demand of water jumped up sky high. But the main reason, according to some scientists, is that Jordan, as a desert country, just doesn't have enough water to grow all its own food. It's overstretching nature. Professor Tony Allen is an expert on the water crisis in the Middle East. Jordan only has enough water, really, to uh, provide water for its uh, drinking, domestic and other jobs. It has a little water that could be used for agriculture and food. The fact that it's using most of its water to, to grow food is not um, rational to an outsider and it's not rational for Jordan's environment. It may not be rational, but it's certainly profitable. Farmers in Jordan have far fewer restrictions on their water use than in the urban areas, and they pay less than a fifth of the price for it. The minute the government they will ask us for paying money, we will get put out of the business because actually every item goes into our agricultural production is increasing. The situation for agriculture is getting uh, more and more difficult. Annually, agriculture consumes 65% of the total water supply, yet it contributes only 2.5% of GDP. According to the Jordanian Water Ministry itself, without the demands of agriculture, Jordan would have double the amount of water it currently needs for domestic and industrial use. Manufacturers claim that using so much water for irrigation is damaging some of Jordan's industries, like this yeast factory. Water is essential in this business. When the plant was established here, it was due to the availability of fresh water where we get from a well. But the extraction for farming is reducing the amount of water available to the factory. Nationally, according to US aid, industry generates 100 times the income per cubic meter of water than is generated by agriculture is only financial benefit to the farmers. There is no economic value to the national economy. And you have to change this formula. You have to make it financially and economically viable to our people and to our country. The farmers' demand for water is also draining the country's aquifers, such as Azraq, which is Jordan's biggest bird sanctuary. Now it is really over pumped and there's uh, not enough now water for people and for birds. So it wasn't uh, the debate between water and birds. The birds were indicators of the sustainability of the use of water. Simply put, meeting the demands of agriculture is exceeding by far nature's capacity to replace the aquifer. Already the country is facing new costs in the purification of deep water supplies. Water start having more dissolved solids in the underground water which makes the water is not suitable for drinking purposes. And the environmental cost to treat this water or to replenish it is about 1.5 US dollar per cubic meter. For Jordan, that works out at $100 million a year, work which nature would be doing for free were it not being hopelessly overstretched. So some economists are saying Jordan shouldn't waste water by irrigating its arid lowlands at all. 
They believe it should be allowed to return to its natural state, desert. Definitely I'm against growing any fruit trees in the desert. The desert, it has its own environment. It has its own biodiversity, okay? We should keep that as it is. Jordan already imports 90% of its food, and some scientists say it should import even more, like most developed countries. Because it takes a 1,000 tonnes of water to raise just one tonne of grain. So if you import a tonne of grain, it's as if you're importing a 1,000 tonnes of water. At least as far as the people of Jordan are concerned, for instance, they don't have to find <laughs> a 1,000 tonnes of water for that tonne of wheat, which is immensely useful politically as well as economically. The government is trying to increase food imports and to raise the price farmers pay for water, which could drive many desert farmers out of business. But it's a difficult political decision. We have like around between 1.5 to 2 million Jordanian working in agriculture. Comparing to around 5.5 million of a population, it's a, it's a huge number. If you tell them stop uh, farming, then you have around 2 million Jordanian jobless. It's a political deadlock, so the International Union for Conservation of Nature is pressing for the creation of a traditional Islamic fund known as WAKF for restoring the balance between people and nature and investing in watersheds. The notion of WAKF has been uh, confined only to specific domains, which is basically mosques or orphans, social affairs. But the, uh, now IUCN is trying to include uh, socio-economic development, sustainable development and water issues. But this could be too little and too late. The Jordanian government is looking for a solution on a grand scale to its water crisis. The plan is to join the Dead Sea and the Red Sea by a canal. In theory, this could provide enough water via desalination to meet Jordan's current needs. But even with the help of hydropower generated by the gradient of the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, it's still energy intensive. And it will cost around $4 billion. Nature just can't keep up with our demand for water. By 2050, the UN estimates the global demand for water will jump by a third. The Global Water Policy Project, a leading water think tank, estimates that providing that extra water through desalination alone will cost us $1 trillion a year. Such is the price tag for overstepping nature's boundaries. So who are the people with a vision for the business end of nature? In each episode of Nature Inc, the end note comes from the visionaries. This week we hear from the Director of Technology Research and one of the world's leading financial analysts. Water is not the most tradable of assets, but the scarcer it becomes, um, then uh, the more likely it is to be traded. And it is likely that, an, a, that a country's wealth may in time be regarded in terms of its water reserves, in the same way that um, oil um, is something which is um, traded um, and which is also a reflection of a country's um, wealth. 